Thank you for having me here today. Um, I wore the cloth of our nation in the U.S. Navy, as you mentioned, for over 31 years, both in war and in peace. I was on the ground in Afghanistan shortly after the war began for a brief period when I headed the Navy's strategic anti-terrorism unit. I came out and commanded an aircraft carrier battle group against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. When I was ashore, the Navy, in between sea tours, would first send me off to Harvard University for a doctorate in economics and in national security. So whenever I came ashore every two or three years, they'd put me in policy positions, such as working for President Clinton in the White House as his director for defense policy. But when I came home from the war, my daughter, then four years old, had brain cancer. Given only 8% chance to live with the type she had, I got out and stayed with her, and she beat that demon. My payback to her to the country was to thank them for the health care plan I got, was to go back to my two to one, nearly two to one Republican district where I grew up and become the second Democrat since the Civil War, running on one thing. I'm a retired Navy Admiral, running on national security that begins at home in health security. I worked on issues that I loved, autism, first movement of it, in, money into it in 12 years, elder abuse, a hidden disease, first bill passed on it in 17 years. And as I did yesterday with the Iowa Safe Schools Program up in the state capitol, sitting down with 20 youth of the LGBT community working against discrimination for marginalized communities. But today, as I stop, I'm really pleased to be here. Because if you come aboard that aircraft carrier that was under my command with 5,000 sailors, their average age was 19 and a half. They ran a nuclear reactor. They fixed your plane before you took off. If anybody doesn't believe the youth of America aren't great, come aboard an aircraft carrier. And the reason I love them, youth are not burdened with experience. They're willing to look at things differently. And heaven forbid, from climate change to getting the right health care policy today, we need that now. Thank you. Yes, sir. Please take a seat. Now, Admiral, uh, the first question you'll receive is one that every other candidate has gotten. When registering to attend this event, almost 57% of students reported that they would be eligible to vote in the 2020 election. Yet only 44% said that they planned to. If you win the Democratic nomination, what will you do to engage America's youth and increase voter participation? I'll do what I've done so far. This is the fourth high school I've come to. We're setting up two more in New Hampshire when we take off to be there on the 1st of October. I've done one in Massachusetts. I left New Hampshire and I was there to go down because they had invited me. This time we're reaching out actively for it. When I was out of the service, I always went to high schools. And when I was in the Congress, I went to a school because I was on the Education Committee every single week. Because I always remembered when I voted, before you had the internet, and you'd have to go to the Persian Gulf and sometimes mail there took something like six to seven weeks to get it. I dropped my ballot in if I could before I departed. And about 40% of the time, military ballots overseas never got registered. I, with all my brothers and sisters, fought, defended America for one purpose, our blessed sanctity of fair and free elections. It's a nation of laws, not men. And so I go to schools purposely to try to excite people into why they should vote. I actually think you'll find this time that it's just not that they want to replace the president. I think you're going to find that as I go around anywhere, people are seeing that there's a lack of accountability for doing the right thing in our nation. And I think you'll see the turnout more. So in short, I'll continue to do what I'm doing, just like I went with 20 high school youth yesterday up at the state capitol, and I mentioned, don't forget to vote. Your next question will come from a student in the audience. His name is Michael Mitchell, and he is at Waukee High School. Um, what is your plan for gun reform, and how will you make I'm sorry, say again? What is your plan for gun reform, and how will you make schools and public spaces safer? Gun control. Yeah. You have your plan for gun control. Um, I represented, as I mentioned, a nearly two-to-one Republican district. And when I talked about accountability for doing the right thing, I had an F from the National Rifle Association. <laughs> There's a picture of me on my website. Because even as a Navy Admiral, I would go out boarding ships, climbing up 150 feet rope ladders, as others stood there with the assault weapons, because we didn't know what we'd find on board. But I have that picture up there. 
And right under it, in my script, it says, but I don't want those guns here on the streets and roads of America. I believe that we have to have background checks, yes, but also close the gun loopholes and show loopholes, also the gun kit loopholes. But more than that, we have to make sure that we treat this as a public health issue. How can it not be? My daughter herself just graduated from high school. Her brain cancer came back last year. It's the reason I'm late. But she had to go through two lockdowns. Last year she had to do it online because of her brain cancer coming back. And the trauma that that can cause people is enormous. We also have to recognize that we used to have reporting that came from public schools. And when I was in Congress, I looked at those reports about the violence that each schools have, including bullying, and they were falsified. So we have to make sure we do what we say in the military, expect what you inspect, and make sure that we go back to that system and make sure they're appropriately done. Because that's the way accountability can be done for making sure that schools do meet the standards of making sure, like my daughter's school now does, of not only being able to lock down, but preventing someone from entering unjustly. Thank you. Your next question will come from Elise Huey. Uh, she's a student at Urbandale High School. Hi, I'm Elise Huey, and I've been in bird rehabilitation for five years. How do you Where? plan to protect... Where huh? Where'd you live for five years? Iowa bird uh, yeah. rehabilitation. How do you protect wildlife and the habitats of animals in the United States and beyond? Uh, what a wonderful question. As you probably read last week, 27% of birds' species have disappeared. Uh, excuse me, not species, but num the percentage of them. Um, and when I used to be in Congress, um, I would vote on uh, animal rights. And what we have to do every time I can is, if you don't know, the House of Representatives is the people's house. And you're allowed to take your child, if you're a House representative, in to vote. And for you, they can actually push the button if they're 12, 12 or under. And every time there was something on animal rights, my daughter would come in, as well as climate change, and push the button, as long as it wasn't during the school day. Uh -huh. So what we have to do is recognize that this truly is a climate change issue. The migration of them is what's being harmed as they begin to go into areas that they don't belong naturally. And so if there is a call for us to do this, it is to address climate change. And we all must remember that even if we are successful here in implementing, let's say, the new Green Deal, let's say you could even do it in a decade, if that's all we do, it's insufficient and it won't matter. 85% of all greenhouse global emissions come from abroad. China will build 1,600 coal plants in the next decade. The tropics has 8% of air conditioning. They'll have 50% by 2050. If we don't have someone who convenes the world and makes the 194 nations who aren't meeting their national commitments begin to meet them, and even more, when those nations have 50% air conditioning, if they use the average level we have today of efficiency instead of the most efficient, it'll be equivalent to deforesting two-thirds of the Amazon. And the damage that you talk about will continue. So would you then bring together world leaders to come up yes. with a plan or a deal? Here's what I'm going to do my very first day. Okay. Actually, it's going to take 36 hours. <laughs> I will have a town hall in the middle of America because I am running most to unite this country. Because all these wonderful policies and plans everybody has, if we have another president who can only do executive orders and then they rip them out, how are we ever going to get policies through? When I represent that Republican district, I got reelected even with an F from the NRA. And 100% from NARAL, 100% from National Organization of Women, 95% of Human Rights Campaign by 20 points, and I didn't spend a penny on a campaign ad. We disagreed well. So after that town hall in the middle of America to say, I want to hear it all, I'll fly to Paris that same day and convene the world, restoring US leadership, where this administration is coming home, kicking bruised allies behind and saying it's a wrap. How else are we going to disarm that bomb of climate change before it explodes enough when 85% of the fragments come from overseas, 
Yes. We're going to convene this world. Because of the breadth and depth of global experience this nation invested in me, from the White House to visiting 80 countries in my career, we must, because that is how we protect the American dream. The global court of justice we created, and presidents from John F. Kennedy all the way to Ronald Reagan understood it was this global concord and our leadership of it that enhanced and protected our American dream. And now, against the greatest threat to humanity, climate change. Your next question will come from Carson Codell. He's a student at Valley High School. As president, how will you handle the emergence of technology replacing jobs as we have already seen in manufacturing? Enormous, and thanks for the question. As I went through here in Iowa, I met a precision agronomist. I said, what's that? And she said, I'm the one who makes those cornfield rows go very straight. I mean, they're really straight. They're like the army marching in, in, in rows. You come to Pennsylvania, it's kind of like us sailors. We don't march very well. But she said, now we're going doing it again because we're going to have wireless tractors. And I said, what happens to those who drive them? What's that technology going to do? When I ran for Senate, I walked 422 miles across Pennsylvania to get to know people. I met coal miners that were losing their job as technology was moving us into green technology, climate change necessity. What we do here in America, and I'd like to talk about student loans, but why is my party not focused on the 65% of Americans, the artisans who don't have college degrees and use their hands and their minds. The ones I had in the Navy my first job, the plumbers, the welders, the electricians. What happens when technology changes in the Navy? Uh -uh, we don't kick them out. When the F-15 goes away, we send them to the largest community college in the nation, the Air Force Community College, and retrain them on the F-22. Why aren't we having a program called training for a lifetime, where you're trained in the next higher technology, the coal mine and green energy. The guy who's a gal who's kicked off the tractor, that's why I have a Sustainable Homestead Act, that they are given a seven-year low-interest loan, really hardly paying anything, so they can take some of the discarded farmland here and begin to do regenerative, organic, with no tillage, annual tillage type of farming. That's the program we should be focused on. They're the Clinton supporters. They're the Trump supporters. 11 million people do not have a job today. They're out of the labor participation rate because they no longer have the skills or the money to get a skill to learn. That is one of my number one programs. I wrote about in 2015 in a book I wrote. Unfortunately, I sold six copies. <laughs> but that is beautiful. And that's why we have to get back to some Votech in these schools aligned with community college, and then you train them and retrain them. That's the last great social compact we need once we get health care fixed. The next question will come from Jack Neal. He's a student here at Roosevelt. Hi. Uh, last March, the Senate passed a resolution to end U.S. support for the war in Yemen, but President Trump vetoed it. As president, would you sign a resolution to end U.S. support for the war in Yemen? And how do you hold Saudi Arabia accountable for its actions in the country? Hold who accountable? Yemen? Yemen. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 hold them accountable. Hold Saudi Arabia accountable. Saudi Arabia, yes. Would I sign it? Absolutely. I've already been out on the, uh, 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 and months ago saying this. Look, here's the issue. Um, we no longer lead the world, as I mentioned of where we established after World War II something called the liberal world order based upon our democratic values of individual and human rights, open and fair governments, fair and just markets that cared about the world's collective good. And so when the crown prince of Saudi Arabia can high five President Putin of Russia and feels empowered to murder an American resident in his embassy without any consequences, from the rules-based liberal world order, it's gone way too far. That country has gone in there and indiscriminately killed children. How do I know? Because I've operated with their military. We give them more military supplies than almost anyone else, but they're a very incompetent military. Their enlisted is not, are not Saudis. They're foreign nationals. The officers are Saudis. And when they go into bomb, their training's atrocious their training and their maintenance is, and that's why it's happening. Second, we need to understand that some of the cause of this is Iran. 
And we are actually responsible because we broke our word after we had actually gotten rid of the nuclear warfare capability of Iran, not by our military. We disarmed it with our, the power of our diplomacy, convened the world to get Russia and China to put sanctions on Iran and got rid of the nuclear weapons. And now, now when we broke our word and put more sanctions on them, they're doing even more mischief as those bombs are going to Saudi Arabia. This thing's just gonna ratchet up. Let's stop the conflict that's unnecessary. Let's engage with Iran back in the court. And they have other common interests. They don't like Al-Qaeda, either would do, and begin to work with them to bring them into the rules-based world order. Condemn it, yes. And then we shouldn't be flowing arms over there that aren't being used competently. Now, uh, in the aftermath of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, President Trump uh, conceded that the United States had to be very careful uh, as it came to relations with Saudi Arabia due to the economic reliance. Um, as president, would you be willing to potentially sacrifice uh, you know, part of the economy uh, due to this relation with Saudi Arabia? Let's keep in mind that Saudi Arabia was the one who didn't care about our economic sanctity. They turned off all oil to the world back in 1973 before you were born. And I, we had a great recession. Let's not forget that Saudi Arabia wouldn't, whether you agreed or didn't agree with the Gulf War, let us, until the last moment, use their bases, even though the threat was against them, supposedly. Until the very last moment, they let us a little, little bit. And now they're move, move, removing it all. What kind of an ally, friend, is that? We've got to move off of fossil fuels anyway. <laughs> And as you well know, America has replaced almost anybody with the output of what we can produce because of natural gas and others. We've got to wean ourselves off of that. But do be beholding to someone who audaciously murders an American resident? No. Economics is second. Everywhere I went in the Navy, people expected us, respected us for the power of our economy and for the power of our military, but they admired us for the power of our ideals. As an Egyptian officer who was on my ship when he left said to me, Captain, you treat your enlisted men, because I only had men on that ship, as though they were equal to you. I said, they have due regard for rank. He said, no, that's not what I mean. You treat them as though they're equal human beings. We don't. That is more important than anything. I'd like to bring in Alex Dajkowski. Uh, she's a student here at Roosevelt. Will your healthcare plan as president cover services such as hormone replacement therapy for transgender people? Yeah, will your healthcare plan as president cover services such as hormone replacement therapy for transgender people? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, we're going to ban conversion therapy, okay? Uh, and then, the, but even before I do that, the first thing I want to do my very first day is repeal the ban on transgender pers pe individuals serving in the military. Why? Yes, equality. But I also want the best of the best. If you don't get all the LGBT community that can apply, Q can apply, if you don't get all the women to comply, how are you ever going to have the best of the best? And I could tell you a story of how a woman saved eight, four, if she hadn't been in the F-18 pilot that night, four special forces wouldn't have come home. So number one. Uh, number two, your specific question, though, was on, again, yes, absolutely. Um, we. In the military, we were doing it, you know that, right? The cost of that $1.2 million we did on those um, procedures and surgeries, the cost was $1.2 million over three years. You know what that's equivalent to? <laughs> Two thirds of a theater air missile, one. <laughs> How can we not do it? I mean, this. We have so much more to do. Our prisons today, they have reversed it to where you need to go to a prison, not with the gender you identify with, but where you were assigned at birth. Why? HUD has taken down the regulations prohibiting those 
who are transgender individuals from being give, going to the gender appropriate place. This is why when people are turned away, you find that of those transgender youth, they begin to go into survival sex, prostitution, at the age of 11 to 14. I know, I met with them in Philadelphia. All you're asking for is to be treated like anyone else, and why not? We knew who was LBGTQ in the military. We all knew, 19 and a half years old, you think they didn't know? And it really hurt me when anyone would come up and say, Captain, I am under don't ask, don't tell, and I'd have to kick him out. I just said, don't tell me. You're too good. I don't want to lose you. Good luck. Your next question is going to come from Zachary Rigney. He's a student at East High School. Uh, it's Zachary, but that's fine. Uh, space is dirty. 70% of space junk is in low Earth orbit. Orbit and has the ability to destroy uh, depleted equipment like telescopes and satellites and soon our future. If we as the people of Earth continue to contribute to space junk, our interstellar dreams will become inaccessible. What is your plan to clean up? Uh, so let me just read that to you one more time. 70% uh, of space junk is in low Earth orbit and has the ability to destroy deployed equipment like telescopes and satellites. If we as the people of Earth continue to contribute to space junk, our interstellar dreams will be inaccessible. What is your plan to quote unquote clean up? What a beautiful question. I've never been asked it before. But one start way of starting towards it is, part of that is we're beginning to militarize space. We have one treaty, the Space Treaty, back in the 60s, that only rules out certain types of instruments that can be, as you must well know to ask this question, that uh, we have to do to make sure we don't continue to militarize it. I mean, there's satellites up there meant to bump into others lasers, and we use it for GPS, all that. If there's something I've always wanted to do is just try to halt the militarization of space. The second one is, I'll be frank, I haven't thought on how best to remove it, but do we have to? Absolutely, you've read the, the stories of how close they've come at times. That should not be a hard one to do because we already can put things up why don't we just put a larger one up that moves on over, picks them up, and starts to go through? As I said, I love those 19 and a half year olds I worked with in the carrier because I not only went to war with them, I learned from them as on this one. So I'll put more thought to it with the understanding of that great saying, I think it was like Mr. Sager, that we need to look at space as though so far it's like an ocean that we've only put our toe into. And if we're gonna bump on things in the way, then we better get to it. Thank you. Next, you're going to be hearing from Leslie Christensen. She's a teacher at Monroe Elementary here in Des Moines. I'm sorry that I'm not hearing so well. So it's not you. I lost a little bit of hearing one year in the Navy. That's my excuse anyway. Thanks for being here. How will you improve the public services loan forgiveness program that currently denies more than 90% of applicants? As a social worker, I depend on this program. This is 90% people denied. Uh, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Which one? This. Public Service, oh, yes. Um, let me make sure I have that. These are student loans. Student loans for working in our Yes. Here's what I believe should be done, all right? Yeah, I read about this recently where so many of them were promised this and don't get it. This is the same problem I find with government too much. We have a government that beat Japan and Germany in four years, but it could not roll out a health care website in four years. My gosh, if people are losing trust in government, and government is needed if ever before, it's because of things like this. Where's the accountability for doing what's right? What, you only can expect what you inspect. <laughs> And so I do remember reading about this a few, I'm sorry, it's slow in the uptake, a few uh, weeks or months ago about what do I do? I would go back and grandfather anybody who has been harshly or unjustly done with and make sure that is taken care of. I don't say that gently. I really mean it. It's like I talked about the president breaking our word on the, inner, on the Iranian accord. The biggest deficit we have in America today is not the debt 
It's the trust deficit. And this is emblematic of it. So my email is joe at joesestac.com. So when in the Oval Office, hit me up and remind me. But if I could, can I peel off of this to student loans? I'm sorry? Could I peel off of this to student sure. loans? Sure, go ahead. If you don't mind, thank you for that. And why is it so important is, my gosh, you know, we need to get people into the public service. I believe in a national service program, not in the military, but everybody that could perhaps go into AmeriCorps or Public Corps or go to the nonprofits just like you're talking about. Because when military people meet one another, they look and say, hey, we'd you serve. Imagine if all youth were meeting one another and they've gone over to Nigeria, other places, where'd you serve, you know? And this is part of why you want to do this. But student loans, there's a very simple, just like cheer program there. That's called the repay program. We should make it mandatory, universal, and grandfather that also, where it says any student doesn't ever have to pay off more than 10% of their loan, more than 10% of their income. We should lower that to 5%. And for the lower income after 20 years, it's forgiven. So if you don't have a job, you're not paying back anything. You just put it on hold. In fact, the program says that that income of yours isn't judged of what it is until you take out of it 150% of the equivalent of poverty level income. And the reason for this is we have to keep in mind that students are overburdened. 2% of the youth, 2% since 2005, have a, national, have a student debt of over $50,000. 75%, it's less than $10,000. So I think we can do this in a smarter way than having the 65% of Americans, those who work with their hands and their minds, help pay off those loans, you know, because you're going to have to some way with taxes, and what we want to do is just have a wise decision that doesn't drive them into delinquency and things like that. So if you're unable to pay, you come to stop. And we just have to make that program at existing government, mandatory, grandfather it, everybody's in it, and then people can quietly pay it back. And for those that really have such a big burden because they were unjustly pushed on with money, then we can actually fix, uh, you know, forgive some at the end. It's pretty simple to me. Uh, no, Admiral Sastrak, the last question I'm going to ask you is, uh, over the last few months, you've met with hundreds, if not thousands, of islands. What is the most valuable thing you've learned from those discussions? Uh, it is that Iowa Nice actually does exist. But I call it respect. And I don't really care if I go to a laundromat or it's a Republican in a parade. I've traveled 17,000 miles in this state since June 23rd. I live in Econo Lodge right there on, uh, down in Des Moines, the Merle Hay Boulevard, named for the first American who was killed in World War I, an Iowan. I've run in 13 parades. So there's something that's really special about parades in Iowa. As a woman said when I called her, how many people be on the route? Because I run back and forth and shake every hand. 30,000 hands I've shaken in parades. She said, well, we'll have more than usual. We haven't had a parade for about four weeks. But every time I go through the line, they pass that brochure of mine in, to them in front of me. So when I run over, I said, hi, I'm a retired Navy Admiral running for president. Please take that home tonight and read about me. One out of four, including Republicans or Democrats, we either stand up or sit and reach for my hand and say, thank you for your service. Superintendent just did it here. I don't know if you realize how fortunate you are. That's the trait we need to restore in America. I don't say it lightly. Even when someone says, well, I'm for a wall. And I explain to them, well, you know, we haven't had a birth rate in America to replace those who pass away every year since 1970. If it wasn't for the undocumented and documented, we'd be in a population death spiral. Like Japan, that has no immigration policy. Our economy would be stagnated like theirs. She said, well, I'm still for a wall. But sir, <laughs> I didn't know that. I think you're very blessed here to have that quality of respect for others, much like the young woman, the young person there said. Uh, Do please I wrap take one up minute to have uh, concluding remarks. 
I will wrap up by saying thank you for having me here. As you can tell, I've learned something. But I would like to leave you a story about those 5,000, 19 and a half year old average age sailors that I think tells us what America most wants and most needs today. So come back aboard with me on that aircraft carrier. And when a pilot in the middle of the night gets into that plane and they strap themselves in, they turn on their engine with the brakes on until they're bolted down into a catapult. And then they take the brakes off and somebody, as you're sitting there just like you're in a rodeo here, waiting for that bucking horse to get out, and it feels just like that. They push that button, out you go, into the dark of the night, and there is no amusement park that has a better ride than that. But sometimes, sometimes they say, stop. There's been an ambush over in Afghanistan. We need more F-18s, not that EA-6B. But that pilot won't turn off their engine until they know they've been unbolted from that whip, that sling, that catapult. Because if you turn off your engines, and you're still bolted, and somebody does make a mistake and pushes it, a button, off you go for a great, but the final ride of your life. So a young man or woman, 